Next, I mean, there's one text in the Bible that's a, a terrible thing to read, and it's there, and you might have well known who said it. Jesus Christ said it. And when these people talk about following Christ and being Christ-like and having the love of Christ and sharing the love of Christ, these are, these are uh, sex-crazy, love-romantic uh, milksops. What they do is take all of Christ's teaching they don't like and throw them out of the Bible. They like only the part of the teaching that deals with love, be kind, be sweet, turn the other cheek. Wherever they find Jesus Christ saying something they don't like, they accuse him of hate literature or throw his discourse out as pagan discourse. They don't believe what you're about to read there in Matthew 7:21. Look at it there. Many of men will say in that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this in thy name, so forth in thy name, many miracles in thy name, cast out devils in thy name. And then he'll say to them, and now this is Jesus Christ's own words. I didn't write them. Depart me, you work iniquity. He says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Never knew you as real believers. Never knew you as real followers. Just knew you as reprobates, hypocrites. And in that day, men are going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in your name and cast out devils? In the name of Jesus, be healed. You know. In the name of Jesus, kind of, and that kind of stuff, you know. And that day, he was saying, I never knew you. That's a terrible thing to say. And Jesus said that thing. So these people, this modern, this great new modern ecumenical movement uh, that condemns us, uh, my believing preacher, for talking plain and always saying, hate, 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 hate. I think, I think they're all queers in some way. I think they're all queers. I think there's something about America today where all the men, most, not all the men, but most of the men connect with religious works have lace on their pants. I think so. Uh, there's, a, there's a peculiar kind of a, you don't accept me. You hate me. Something wrong with your jeans, kid? I mean, take take uh, take Rodney King out there. He didn't get beat up as bad as I've seen some hockey players get beat up. And he got four million dollars for it. One shot. There's something effeminate about this generation. I want to be accepted. I want to be accepted. I don't want to be accepted. You don't accept me, except somebody else. I could care less, man. It's a funny, funny kind of an effeminate kind of thing. It just crawls across it. Oh, Luckman, he's just so much hate in his preaching. So much hate in his voice. You don't know what it's like to be hated, brother. Listen, one of my boys said, I don't say I'll be out to get mad at this and that. And I told one of my boys, you never seen me mad yet. you never seen me mad. I haven't got really mad. Not really mad since I was saved. Now, if I got really mad, you'd see some stuff fly, baby. One time when somebody said to me, they said, well, you know, you beat up your wife. I never beat up a woman in my life, man. Sister, if I beat you up, you'd be in the hospital six months. <laughs> you got a whole generation of people think if you say something they don't like, he hate me, he hate me, hate me. You sissy, you girl scout, you, you, you twinkie, you little goody two-shoes. Why don't you go out and eat some raw meat, boy? Uh, why don't you get out? Why don't you play some of this combat football without equipment? See? And, and you find what hate is. How the guy bust your nose and break your teeth out and leave you look like hit with a bull whip? You get the message after a while. But all, you're getting off a corner and now. You think I shouldn't have gone off this direction, but, but I'm trying to drive something home here. <laughs> what I'm trying to drive home here is Christ says some terrible, horrible, negative, hateful, bitter, terrible things, and the folks who profess to follow him just think he's lying. Now, my text says certain things, and it implies certain things. The first thing I want to say about this text is this text implies the possibility that you could be deceived. Now, I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, get saved. I trust your profession of faith is real. I trust if you tell me you've received Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'm going to trust you have. I hope you have. I'm going to take your word for it. I believe you have. But my text implies a possibility, I have to say a certainty, a possibility that you could be deceived. It's possible to be deceived about your salvation. It's possible to think that you have received Jesus Christ, your Savior, and trusting your Savior, when down deep in your heart you're trusting something else. It's possible for a person to think they're saved, not be saved. It's very possible. Matter of fact, Christ says in the last days, many false prophets shall arise, and many shall be deceived. 
And the Bible says in the last days, the seducer shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Oh, you've got to admit, there's a possibility you could be tricked. Oh, Brother Rupp and I couldn't be tricked, but there's a possibility you could be. I mean, uh, I read, I got an article back here in my uh, study about some wine they were selling over there in Italy, and they sold it for something like 20 years, a big company, made a lot of money off it. And one day they took that thing and got analyzed, and that wine, that wine was one half ox's blood. Well, people drinking blood. They took blood from the slaughterhouse and filled the bottle half up with blood and then half up with wine. Well, 20 years is a pretty good stretch for deceiving folks. Um, it's possible to be deceived every, every month or maybe every week in some hospital. Somebody gets the wrong type blood transfusion. I've got case, not one or two. I've got case after case after case where some nurse in the hospital would give something to a baby and it uh, turns out to be poison. It's the wrong bottle with the wrong label. It's a, poss- it's a possibility you could be deceived. Why, right down there in Houston, Texas, about 15 years ago, there were 23 little old boys between about 8 years old and 16. About 20 of them, 23 of them, they were all deceived. A guy came by in a, in a kind of a van and gave them some candy and offered them a ride, and they got in the back of the thing. When they came through, they were strapped to a table down in a basement with a rock. The FM thing going so loud they couldn't hear themselves scream, and they were tied up, and he had a sheet of plastic across there so the feces and the blood wouldn't soak into the board. And he tortured those kids eight, nine hours at a time and raped them and then murdered them. He gave fool. Those kids were a fool. Twenty-three of them in one shot. Uh, there's a possibility you could be deceived about salvation. You have to admit there's a possibility. Why, you take uh, a friend of mine up there in Alabama, his name is uh, Folsom. And uh, Folsom uh, was a Methodist preacher up there. And his wife got terribly sick and went to the hospital. And when she got there, uh, they had her upstairs. And the, and the church go downstairs in the waiting room praying for her and praying for her. And they just got n- news from the uh, people upstairs. The operation was a success. They were downstairs in the waiting room all praising God and thanking God. About that time she died. They found the nurse had given her the wrong kind of blood or something up there mixed up in a transfusion. And, and she was dead. And right when they were praising God, she died. They were deceived. <laughs> Just a possibility. But I'm just saying, thank you, Lord. Bless God. Glory to God. Thank God she got through praise. She's dead. Just a possibility. Uh, you take Columbus's journey to San Salvador reminds very, uh, one very much of the administrations of JFK, Carter, and Clinton. <laughs> and they say Columbus, when he went out, didn't know where he was going. And when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he came back, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> it's kind of like a Democratic uh, liberal party, you know. Just kind of wandering around, you know, peeling off money out of your pocket while they're doing it. It's possible to be fooled. You know what a lot of people think? A lot of Christians think this. They think the better you know Hebrew and Greek, the better you can know the Bible. <laughs> they really believe that. I'm mean, the dumb thumps actually think that. They think the fellow who knows the most Greek and Hebrew knows the Bible best, because the Bible is in Greek and Hebrew. Well, that must be the most deceptive thing you ever heard of in all your life. <clears throat> now, I know Hebrew and Greek scholars. They're some of the dumbest thumps I ever found out the back end of a dumpster. You take Robert Dick Wilson, could read, write, and speak 26 different languages. That poor fellow didn't know as much about the Word of God as kids in our day education Bible school that are 10 years old. Literally. I'm not overstating. Literally. The little boys and girls there, and 10 years old, and they make, make Bible school no more about the future than Robert Dick Wilson, though, from Princeton, with five earned degrees and two of them overseas, Heidelberg and Edinburgh. Now, uh, what's the trouble? <clears throat> the trouble is you're deceived. It's possible to be deceived. You take a couple of years back, 1978, I didn't uh, know about it until I checked the date on the other night, but in 1978, Ted Kennedy got up <clears throat> before Congress and suggested a uh, a national holiday for Martin Luther King, Jr., with a flag at half-mast. And the only person that opposed him was Jesse Helms in North Carolina. And Ted Kennedy at that time uh, was fornicating, just like Martin Luther King, Jr. was fornicating. One was a fornicating socialist, one was a fornicating Marxist. Now, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking morals. Some of you dumb thumps out there. I'm talking morals. I'm in the fellow says he's a great good to see the fellow said he was a Marxist, and you couldn't print his private life. You had to print Herbert Hoover, uh, Herb, not Herbert Hoover, but uh, Yeager, Yeager Hoover. I never gave him mixed up with the Hoover uh, cleaners, you know, the, the uh, vacuum company. But anyway, Hoover. 
You take uh, Gadger Hooper, they dragged out all his personal stuff and put it on out where you could get it. Why didn't they get Martin Luther King Jr. with it? They're right together. If Jed Good had said that Martin Luther King Jr. is the most notorious liar in America, where's his record? You got one of them. How come not two? Racism, baby. <laughs> Racism. Right? Yeah, amen, amen, amen. Well, that thought, you know what's wrong with Ted Kennedy? He was deceived. Unless I have a national holiday for a fellow who's out to overthrow a country. You're blind, you're a fool, you're tricked. There's a possibility that uh, down deep in your heart, you're trusting your good works to save you. I don't know. I hope not, but there's a possibility. There's a fellow named David uh, Chakahashley. And David Chakahashley was a Russian from the Ukraine who was a janitor in a museum. And that fellow uh, posed as a, as a scientific lecturer on ancient Egyptology, and he'd never been to school above high school day in his life. And he was a janitor. And the first lecture that he set up, he got $820 for it. And after that, he was paid uh, uh, $20 an hour for lecturing on ancient Egyptology, showing people through a museum where he was a janitor. <laughs> and got away with it for 10 years. I mean, to see. Kind of like that fellow used to go around the country uh, giving uh, talks on archaeology and geology, and his chauffeur took him everywhere he went. And finally, the chauffeur had uh, heard so much of it, he thought he could handle it himself. He heard so many questions and answers, he'd memorize all the answers his boss had given. So he figured, I could handle that. And so he told his boss, said, the next time you have a big lecture and a big crowd, why don't you let me answer the question? Well, I think I can answer them. I've heard them all. I heard you answer them. And he said, okay, go ahead. So he got up there and uh, did pretty well, you know, for four or five lectures. And finally, in one lecture, the, the boss just sat out in the congregation, out in the crowd, you know, and watched the thing, you know, and the chauffeur went up and fielded the questions. And finally, one fellow got up and said, Does goniferous tissue and diaclite stone omniferous or not? And the chauffeur laughed and said, Well, that's a silly question. That's so simple, I think I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. That's the guy I Let his boss answer it. <laughs> There's a possibility you can be deceived. Now, I'll tell you something else about the text. The text also does this. The text nullifies good works. If any text in the Bible nullified all good works, this would be the text. Because the text says, We've done many wonderful works in your name, and they're not saved. That text, you read, nullifies all good works as a means of salvation. Jesus Christ did not come to share your sins. He came to bear your sins. You say, well, I believe in good works, the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. That's a fairy tale for grown-ups. There are two fairy tales for grown-ups. One is called the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the other is called uh, go- uh, evolution. Those are fairy tales for big kiddies, you know, haven't, haven't grown up yet. Make them feel good. Kind of like, like dope, keep them in a kind of a passive state. I mean, if anybody could have got saved, these fellows could by works. They did many more work works in his name. They cast out devils in his name. They did miracles in his name, and they weren't saved. That nullifies forever in this business of good works. I mean, suppose you could get saved by good works. Well, if you got to heaven after this age, the church age, where a man is saved by grace through faith, if you got to heaven, you'd be an oddity. I mean, you'd be out of place up there. Up there, they say, let's sing. What do we sing about? And you'd say, well, let's sing about how I repented, confessed, and believed was baptized. And some would say, well, shut your mouth, man. We're singing here about the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Unto him that loved us and died for us and washed our sins in his own blood. You're not going to get, get to heaven for works. And those who believe it never could agree on how much, uh, how much uh, works they have to, to do. A fellow said one time, well, what if I just straighten up, live right, and don't commit sin, live a sinless life the rest of my life? Well, what about your past life? What about the past deaths? Suppose you straighten up tonight, never drink again, never smoke again, never cuss again, never lie again, never steal, uh, steal again, never uh, do anything wrong again the rest of your life and live a sinless life. What about up to now? There's a death. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left the crimson stain, he washed me white as snow. One time I thought I got saved through a dream. And he dreamt that he died, and when he died he said he saw a ladder going up to heaven. And he thought he'd climb up and get into heaven, so he climbed, and he climbed, and he climbed, and he climbed. And he kept on climbing and climbing, and it seemed like he'd been climbing for years. And finally got the top of the ladder, and when he got the top of the ladder, he saw a door. 
And he got up the ladder and started through the door. Just about that time, an angel stepped forward and strong armed him and spun him around and said, How'd you get up here? And the fellow said, I climbed up that ladder. And the angel said, Christ is the goal, and if a man ends up, comes up any other way, he's a thief and a robber. Get out. If you had climbed to heaven by your work, they'd kick you out when you got there. Come up by another way. He's a thief and he's a robber. And I'm going to draw a wing of these angels. And you know angels don't have wings. I guess you know that. Uh, but you have to draw a wing on them. You know, or people don't know what they are. You know, if you, you don't put a wing on them, they say, Let's say that thing, Danny. It's, a, it's an angel. That's what it is. So I, I put wings on them so you know they're angels. And Christ says in one place, is that the angel shall come forth and cast in the furnace of fire, there shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. It nullifies forever this matter of good works. Uh, the people, people all over America today uh, that think they're saved don't even believe in hell. If you don't believe in hell, what do you get saved from? Saved from, saved from what? You say saved from death. You're not saved from death. You all die anyway. What are you saved from? All, all up and down this country are getting more and more decisions for Christ that are based on nothing except, I just want to do better than what I'm doing. Back then the Chicago fire took place, thousands of people got together all kinds of packages and stuff and food and clothing and stuff and sent those people and said to the people in Chicago who've been burned out, who've been burned out. Now our case is, our case is, see, we, got, we were headed for hell. And somebody got us out and took care of us. We were about to get burned. Now, the thing is, a lot of people in America today, when they think about salvation, they don't even think about that. They don't think God would burn them anyway. What were they saved from? They're not saved. To be saved, you've got to be lost. They talk about the Romans' road. Maybe the Romans' road, all right. When I deal with a person in personal work, I never deal with the Romans' road. I deal with the Revelation road. I never begin with the way the sinner is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. I don't tell you anything. I begin with, I saw a great white throne here and sat upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth fled away, there was no place for them. And I saw the dead and small and great stand before God, and the books were open, and the dead were judged out of those things with the books according to their works. And whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the place to begin. Then talk about salvation. It, it nullifies all good works as a means of salvation. That isn't all. It magnifies the need of making your calling and election sure. In Second Peter chapter, uh, Second Peter chapter one verse ten, Simon Peter says, "Wherefore, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure." Uh, you want to see whether you're elected or not? Make sure of it. Make sure you are one of the elect. Don't sit around by the like these dumb five-point hard shell tulip cowboys sitting around waiting for God to elect you. Simon Peter says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You make sure if, if God is saved, if you're one of the elect, you make sure you are. You say, how? Search your heart. Go back over the ground. Make sure you're trusting nothing but what Christ did. Don't, don't allow yourself to be trusting anything else. Make, make sure, make your, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. I've known, of a, I've known of preachers who preached for 20 years and then professed just to have gotten saved. Now, maybe they were just messed up doctrine. I recognize that. And I recognize that everybody professed, well, I just got saved. You know, I thought I'd been saved for 40 years, and then I got saved. Some of those people, people just got messed up in hyper-Calvinism. And they got thought, I recognize that. But still, there's such things as a, there's a possibility. Uh, L.R. Shelton said he'd been preaching 25 years before he got saved. I don't know if that's so. I know Judas preached three and a half years. He never did get saved. And he and Christ were just like that. They are sitting at the same table eating together. So this thing here, it shows that you should make diligence uh, to make your calling and election sure. I preached one time over in, uh, in uh, Bay, uh, no, Mobile, Alabama, at a church out there in the country, and I preached on uh, com, uh, 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 go, coming back to Bethel, or going back to Bethel. And you know the text that's over there in uh, uh, Genesis where Jacob has come back in the promised land and things aren't going right, and his daughter's been raped, you know, and his... Oldest boy there, Reuben, is going in and shacked up with his wife and that kind of thing, and he makes up his mind it's time for them to get right. And he has them go back to Bethel, back to Bethel. And they go back to the place where uh, Jacob first met God when he ran from his brother Esau. And I finished preaching on back to Bethel, back to Bethel, and gave them patience that night. A lot of Christians got things right and came back to their Bethel, you know, the place where they first encountered God, had their first experience with God, that kind of thing. 
that was a great night. And when that thing was all over, nobody was saved. A lot of Christians got right. And that night, uh, Deacon and his wife uh, went home, and they're lying in bed there, and both of them just kind of wide awake, not saying anything, until about a little after midnight. About after midnight somewhere, the wife suddenly turned to him and said, You know something, honey? He said, What? She said, We don't have any Bethel to go back to. <laughs> and he started thinking the same thing. <laughs> And they phoned the pastor up. He came over there after midnight led him to Christ. Now, you can't go back to Bethel if you've never been there. What is Bethel? That's the place where you first met God. There's always a kind of a special place in the heart of every child of God when he thinks about the place where he got saved and under the conditions. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't drive by it much anymore, but over there on St. John's used to be the old Brent Baptist Church. And long ago, it turned into kind of a, a, a swank, kind of a richy joint for rich folks to display their clothes in. But it didn't always used to be that way. Brent, they used to run the aisles at Brent. They used to shout, boy. You never know it now. They used to shout so loud the singers complained the a meaning was interfering with their performance. <laughs> I'll never forget old Geddes Allen sitting up there on that platform trying to figure that thing out. He's down with PCS right now, but he hadn't got to figure it out yet. The Holy Spirit could work across that thing. It'll get us to kind of look around like this, you know, like a law sheet on the side of a mountain. But you take, you take, you take the old Brent Baptist Church, and I go by there. I always get kind of a feeling for it. That's, that's the place where I found Christ. Just have a Bible, open Bible there in front of that thing. Thy word is a light to my feet right in front of that, on the front step. That's where I got saved. That, that, that sometimes your Bethel is not where you get saved. Sometimes your Bethel is some place where you and God had some uh, deep experience of uh, consecration or surrender. Some place where God dealt with you definitely about something that, uh, that you needed to get in your life fixed up and you yielded and got things right. Sometimes your Bethel is a place like that. But listen, if you're not saved, you don't have any Bethel to go back to. You don't have Bethel to go back to. You've never been there. You, this thing magnifies the need of making your calling and election sure. You say, oh, Ruckman, you pre preachers always talking this negative stuff and talk about people dying and people going to hell and can't. Well, if you quit dying and going to hell, quit talking about it, okay? You saw Pearl tore up talking about dying. Dying. Stop dying or quit talking about it. <laughs> Just stop dying. Can you stop dying? <laughs> You're not going to stop dying. We're going to talk about dying. And that is no. If we're going to talk about eternal death, if men still go to eternal death when they die, we're going to talk about that. And, uh, and warn you, and sound the alarm, and blow the trumpet. And that if you don't like it, then uh, that'll be tough apples. It won't be our fault. We don't want to be kind to take care of things. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of years ago, a couple of farmers were going fishing one night, got up early in the morning, you know, about 3 o'clock, headed down toward the place. About 4 or 5 in the morning, they passed by a sign there on the way down the fishing hole and said, Bridge out. And you know how that is. You always go down to see if it's so, you know. And they went on down the, the road, and sure enough, it was washed out. And they came back about an hour later after they'd messed around about an hour, and going out of the way about an hour trying to check that bridge. And when they came back, they went by the back of the same sign, the back of the same sign, they saw a word that said, It was, wasn't it? <laughs> now, don't you, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's a hell. Don't go to see if there's one. And then come back and say, well, Ruckman, you said there was. You're not coming back. You're not coming back. Make, uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Uh, don't, don't be out there eternity somewhere someday saying, uh, well, if I'd, if I'd only been more careful, if I'd only been more careful, if I'd only been more careful, carelessness and presumption is a characteristic of this age. The characteristic of this age is a bunch of people that, that think they, they, don't, they, they, don't, they think they can get away with anything. And they talk that in television and places. And this was raised a bunch of people who are stupid and irresponsible. They're irresponsible children. And that's where the government wants them. They want, they want them dependent upon the government. That's what they want. But it makes a terrible, terrible, terrible nation of people to live with. A bunch of people who don't take, take care or trouble or time with anything and get everything wrong. Everything mixed up. It's the work of television. It's the work of the new media. Uh, get, making you presumptuous, thinking you can get away with anything and just have your lifestyle and just do as you cotton picking well please. And you can't. Uh, Jack Hyle was in the Army years ago in a, in a, in a parachute battalion. I think it was about time of, uh, of the uh, Korean conflict, I think. I don't think it was World War, uh, World War II. 
But he and a buddy were packing chutes for a demonstration one night. And going to be a bunch of big shots, a bunch of big brass out the next day, and they're going to uh, have a big aerial demonstration here, going out on 110 for one of those outfits, so uh, going to put on a demonstration for all the top brass. And he and his buddy stayed up that night packing chutes. Now, when you pack the chutes, you have to stamp a number on them, showing you're the packer who packed the chute. And they were staying up all night and packing these things and up on coffee and all stuff, staying awake. And I mean, packed for 10 hours at night, packed all through the night. And the next day, the demonstration came, and all the big top brass were there, you know, all the generals and full colonels, you know, and chickens and oak leaves and everything else. And I had all these fellas keep coming out of these planes like popcorn, sailing down. About that time, I saw one of them just coming down just like a streamer, or that old chute dragging out behind him, wham, that old boy hit the ground. You could have started me a foot. And all those big brass came in over there and siren, you know, and medical units and all everybody, you know, get on, you know, and all the newspaper reporters and all this stuff. They came up there and they uh, called for the packers who packed this fellow's chute, packed the fellow's chute, and they called for Jack and his buddy. And Jack said, on the way to that thing, riding out that thing where all those colonels and majors and generals were, he said, I fucked myself. Oh, my God. I hope it's not my number. I hope it's not my number. I hope it's not my number. And they got out there, and it wasn't. It was the other kid. The other kid had packed the chute. And he said, when they gave the number in that chute and gave it to that kid, and all those eyes turned on him, that kid began to scream, you know, and just about pull his hair out and began to yell, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful. Now listen, don't you want in the lake of fire and then stop this stuff about if I've just been more careful. Uh, you got a chance tonight to be just as careful as you want to be. Amen. And it probably isn't the first chance you've had. You folks down south, it's probably the first one you've had. You've probably had a lot of them. And don't you get down there and say, if I've just been more careful, I've just been more careful. You could have been more careful. The thing is, you just... You didn't really take it seriously. If you took it seriously, you'd get saved. I mean, uh, we give invitations. We all know a man doesn't have to come forward in a church to be saved. We all know that. We give invitations. Why is that? That's to draw the line. That's to make it clear. That's to flush you out. You what's that for? Is to make sure that you're careful about it. Is to make sure that you don't uh, say, well, I just got to say, no, fix it. Put the number on it. Stamp it. Make sure about it. This thing here, it says, this thing is, is telling you to make your, your calling and election sure. And don't, don't, don't go to hell and then come out there and say, and say well, if I'd just been more careful. You've got a chance to be careful. Be just as careful about this thing as you can. I tell you, before I was saved, I was a big enough fool in a lot of ways. And my big thing was taking dares, you know. You know, little fellow's always prone to that, you know. Always get some little guy on that, you know. Trying to show how tough he is. Always throwing something at you. And if you got any backbone, you know, you can take him on, you know, just to try to prove something. <laughs> big fellow don't have to prove it. Little fellow does, you know. He play hockey out here. He used to play hockey. <laughs> we'll be playing Monday, Wednesday, and Friday if you want to play. But you take out there one night, I saw a big old fellow. I won't mention his name. I want to embarrass him. But he's a big boy. about six feet two, maybe, oh, 200 and... 30, 20, 30 pounds, and he was a he was a foul player, a cheap shot. Most big guys are not like that. Most big guys can handle themselves well enough. They don't have to be take cheap shots, but he did all the time. And and we knew about it. And didn't say much about it, you know. He kid him out a couple of times. And finally one night we had a big old boy named Ellis played out there. Uh, he was Mike Ellis. Is that his name, Mike Ellis. And Mike Ellis, I'm playing goalie, and Mike's on my left playing defense. And every time this big fellow would start down on the side, Mike would yell at him and say, Come on, boy, come on. Come on, you go to try me out, boy. Come on, boy, you coming in? That fellow never did. He never did. He'd get rid of the puck and go around somewhere. He'd never come in on Ellis. He'd never come in on it. And I just stood at that, at that gate and marveled about that. I was, Why don't he come in? So he'd get creamed. Well, but, but it's the principal involved. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to let the guy talk you out of it, are you? I guess the last game of tough football I played was about, about seven years ago, and, and I got the line opposite Mike Ellis and some other guy almost as big when they were on the offense. You say, what for? It's a challenge. <laughs> hey. You say, they'll cream you. Yeah, but you can slow them down. Yeah, that's right. See, you can't stop them, but you can slow them down. What's going to back out? 
My, 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 my. My text here, my text here says in so many words, you better be careful. You better trust more than just doing good works. You better trust them doing more than just miracles. You better sense it. When the invitation is given instead of playing coward back there and stand back there and hiding, come on down. Step in. Show your colors. Come on, boy, be a man. Like I said, I think this whole last two generations has gotten, I don't know what's wrong, pink blood or yellow blood or something, you know. I think that's why you get invitations hard to get everybody to come forward. I mean, grown men stand back there after service to go out the door and say, well, I know it's right, and I'll, I'll copy back next week. What are you, what are you, man or a mouse? Well, I said, give me a piece of cheese and you'll find out. <laughs> Move, boy! Move! I wouldn't tell you to do nothing I wouldn't do myself. You give me a dare on it, I'll take it. Tell you at the end of the service tonight. You say, Ruckman, I'll go down there in front of those people who get saved if you'll crawl down this on your hands and knees and kiss my shoe. Do you think I won't do it? Amen. Come on, buddy. Call my hand, okay? The invitation up. Call it. See what I'll do. If you don't mean business, you better be careful. <laughs> yeah. I'll be back there crawling right in the aisle all over. <laughs> Hey. Some of you folks don't think I would, do you? Hey. Now, some of you folks know me. How many of you think I would? Let me see your hand. There you go. There you go. Be careful, Sonny. Be careful. Be a sweet boy. <laughs> I'm enjoying this if you're not. <laughs> all right, that isn't all. This text verifies the certainty of eternal banishment. If anything in the Bible verifies the certainty of eternal banishment, this does it. This is like uh, depart from you, cursed and everlasting fire, for prayer of the devil and his angels. These people think God won't do it. Christ said he'll do it. He said, depart from me that work iniquity, I never knew you. In plain words, get out. I don't know who you are. In other places, you know what he said? He said he shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather all things that do iniquity, and gather them out of his kingdom. And listen, listen. Cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's Jesus Christ talking. That isn't me. I didn't write those words. That's the Lord Jesus Christ talking. And the Lord Jesus Christ said there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Depart from you, cursed. Be gone. Get out. I don't know you. Don't want to know you. Never knew you. Nothing to do with you. It verifies the certainty of eternal banishment. Once you're gone, you're gone. Like I said, that fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man stuff, that's a fairy tale for grown-ups. But nothing that thing at all. You don't really believe that. I mean, these people of the Swiss doctor, Cooper Ross, you know, God's everybody's father, you know, and uh, Janet Reno and all the dikes and fairies and fruits up in Washington, D.C., run around Hershey City. You take those people up there and talk about God being everybody's... <laughs> God being everybody's father. Why, why, you don't really believe that. You don't really believe that. I'm going to come on, folks. You really believe that Jim Jones, that old Hitler, were, were nice, born-again Christians, and God was their father? You don't believe that. You know what the world does? They say everybody's brother. If they pick out the ones they don't like and say those aren't. No, man. If you're all brothers, then Jim Jones, that old Hitler, just as good as company as Hillary and Billy and all the rest of them. You don't really believe that. I think that's kind of a fair tale for grown-ups. They, they give you, you know, kind of to placate them. God is not any father, anybody's father, but the father of Israel. Israel's my firstborn, and the father of Jesus Christ, my only begotten son, and the father of the child of God. You're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Not by something else. By faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you can think these things, these things are negative, but they're serious. And they're serious subjects because they're negative and they're rejected by modern modern Christians as well as the unsaved people. I'm not just talking about the rejection of the Word of God tonight by the um, by the unsaved people. God's people rejected these pastors. That's why you don't have much soul winning going on. That's why you don't have revivals much anymore. God's people have forgotten people go to hell if they haven't forgotten it. If they haven't forgotten it, they don't talk about it. They don't like to think about it, and they don't preach about it. You take a, when was the last time you heard a 30-minute message on hell? A 30-minute message on hell. 
Those old-time preachers will preach sometimes four weeks in a row, and five of those messages will be 45 minutes from hell. The thing is, why, why, why the, the Christian work that's being done is really Christian work. It's kind of a nice, kind of a sharing and caring and getting together in a cooperative kind of way so we can uh, fix things up and have a better place to live. That has nothing to do with the text. The text says, out! Throw him out! Get rid of him! Out! You're going to hell. Well, then why do you talk the way you talk? Because I've got to give account of myself to God. Bless my soul, people. I don't believe anybody on earth. I don't believe God gave any man on this earth a greater capacity for mirth than he's given me. Well, I've got Calvin Hobbes books all over my house, man, and Crazy Cat, too, and I used to collect Pogo. I'm, I'm, I'll be 71 years old this year, folks. I still collect jokes. i got joke books. You can open my Bible, you'll find 800 jokes written in the margin of my Bible. <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, the Holy Scripture, it's got jokes all the way through it. I don't believe God is getting by this earth any more capacity for mirth or having a good time or enjoying fun like He's given me. But I'll tell you one thing, in the day of judgment, you're not going to point your finger at Ruckman and say, Ruckman, you entertained me, you made me laugh, you made me enjoy those good messages, but you didn't warn me, you didn't warn me, you didn't tell me I was going to burn, you didn't warn me, Ruckman, cursed be your rhetoric, cursed be your sense of humor, cursed be your talent, you didn't warn me. I did too! Amen. Nobody the government got to point a finger at me and say, Ruckman didn't tell me, I told you! And I'll tell you again and again and again and again and again and again and again, you got to shut my mouth! And what you think about what enemies makes to me, it doesn't make any difference at all. I've got to give account to somebody. It ain't going to be you. Yeah. I'm in the day of government. You know what's going to happen? You want to see unsaved people show up there by the thousand, by the hundred, by the million, by the tens of millions, and stand up there and say to certain religious dignitaries, you rascal, you dirty lying rascal, you scourge, you hypocrite, you, you dirty rascal, you stole my soul, you sorry, miserable cur, that's the man right there. You went around and said, peace, 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 and talked about these sacraments, all this crap, and you never told me how to get saved. Yes, sir. They're going to stand up at all this modern positive coping and sharing and sharing and coping. They're going to stand up there and they're going to say, it's his fault, it's his fault, it's his fault. He told me how to adjust. He told me how to cope. He told me how to share. He told me how to get along with folks. He told me how to adjust to my nervous tensions. And he never told me how to be saved. Your fault, preacher, your fault. Not mine. Not mine. I'll just be as nasty as I possibly can be about it, brother. So you can't have any illusion about what I'm saying. You are going to hell without Jesus Christ, and you're going to burn like a torch, and so is your mama and your daddy and your priest. And your rabbi and your pastor. Now, now how's that for murder, huh? I mean, I enjoy a good joke. I enjoy a good laugh. Nobody, like I said, if God give you more capacity for it to give me, I'd be surprised. But the day of judgment, the day of judgment, you're not going to point a finger at me and say, Ruckman lied to me. Ruckman wouldn't tell me. Ruckman was afraid to tell me. Ruckman was worried about his income. Ruckman was worried about his congregation. Ruckman was worried about what folks think. No, he wasn't. I told you. I told you. I told you. You die without Christ. You go into hell. You're going to, they're going to pitch you in. And I didn't say that. Jesus Christ said that. You quit getting upset with Ruckman and start getting upset with Jesus Christ. Amen. He sent forth his angels to gather the iniquity and cast them in a, in a furnace of fire. There should be weeping and grinding and gnashing of teeth. Back to, back to the text. All right, finally, I want to say this about the text. The text amplifies the most horrible words ever spoken on this planet. The most terrible thing ever said on this planet was not said by a gangster. It wasn't said by a judge. It wasn't said by a demagogue or a tyrant or a dictator. The worst words, I know what that I'm going to get into you in a minute. When I get into you, you're going to have to agree with the worst things ever said, and there won't be any opinion about it. What I'm going to quote you is never equal when it comes to hate literature, and horrible things said what I'm about to quote to you surpasses anything that you have access to, or any of your friends. The rubbing you think, no, I'm going to quote it to you in a minute. When I finish quoting it, you'll have to admit there's nothing in the Library of Congress with nine million books that could touch it. The most hateful, negative thing ever said in this earth was said by Jesus Christ. I've heard a lot of hateful, negative things. 
Do you think a man like such as I am is raising bar rooms and beer parlors and barracks and shower rooms and locker rooms and courts and talk to people in jail and heard things out in the sport field, out the dance bands and the crap games? Do you think I haven't heard? You ever have so much turn down the gavel? I said, you'll be hanged by your neck till you're dead. That's pretty tough saying, isn't it? I send you the nine consecutive life sentences. Bap! You know, 895 years. The child is dead. That's a pretty tough statement. Missing an action. Pretty tough. It's terminal. Well, I've heard all that stuff. I'll, I'll give you one worse than that. The worst thing ever said in this earth wasn't said by anybody you know down here. It was said by that sweet... Loving, kindly, lowly, sharing, caring, Nazarene. I'm a lot of hard saying, you know. Your back's broken. I'm sorry you have to live the rest of your life in a wheelchair. I'm sorry, ma'am, it's incurable. Uh, he is missing an action. He wounded. He's dead. You get $10,000. Honey, I've got good news and bad news for you. What's that? Well, first thing I'm running away and running off with Harry Wilson. Okay, what's the bad news? <laughs> <laughs> smile there, smile, see. See, you weren't ready for that, were you? You know, you're not ready for that, and you're, you're kind of stiffening up and kind of resisting what I'm saying, and I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. The worst thing ever heard on this earth was not spoken by anybody you ever saw. It was spoken by this one. They're always bragging about what a sweet, kind, wonderful person he was and how these young men that get out in the street and yell at people don't have the sweet spirit of Christ. And how these young men, you know, that pass out facts and tell people they're going to hell, they don't manifest the sweet spirit of Christ. And Christ loved everybody and get along. Listen, turn to Matthew 25. I'll show you the most terrible words ever spoken in this earth. And nothing could match them. But nothing in any speech by Adolf Hitler or the Shah of Iran or Saddam Hussein or any president that could touch the passage. Couldn't touch it. Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, look down there at verse 41. In verse 41, I'll show you the most horrible, ghastly, negative, terrible thing ever said in this earth. And if Janet and Sarah and Hillary and Billary and all the Clintons, and all the NEA, and all the ACLU, and all the NBC, and ABC, and Life and Time, and look, are right, then Jesus Christ was one of the most wicked men that ever lived. Matthew 25, 41. Back here in the back, somebody read it out for it real loud. Will you stand up and read it real loud? Now, about three times that loud, brother, be just about right. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He said, Depart from me, get out. You cursed, you damned. You damned so and so, get out. Who said that? Jesus Christ said that. In everlasting fire. Burn, baby, burn, and don't quit burning. Just keep burning. That marked Jesus Christ as the greatest hate monger that ever lived. And that's why they keep trying to redo his life and fix it up so it'll be acceptable. That's why you have movies like The Fourth Temptation, and pictures of Christ the hippie, and pictures of Christ as a social reformer, and pictures of Christ as a revolutionary. What they want is a, is a, is a God in their own image. What they want is a Jesus Christ that doesn't say things like he said. You realize what he said? Here's somebody that loved you enough to die for you. And you come up to him this one, listen, that loved you enough to die, I believe in the love of God, that loved you enough to die for you, says, get out, you damn it. Come back. What a thing to say to somebody. Why? He could make it sick. Um, you may have people damn you, but they couldn't make it sick. <laughs> I bet people damn me regular, but don't make a difference. They can't make it stick. I mean, the cursed cause will shall not come, but that one can make it stick. Now, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? You know what Lee said when he had to see Grant there and surrender? 
He said, I've got to go to see Grant today, and I'd rather die a thousand deaths. And outside his men said, don't surrender, General. We'll keep fighting, General. We'll save you, General. And the general was saying, in effect, uh, you're down to rocks. And they were there out of ammo. They're throwing rocks in the bare feet. And they said, no surrender. And he said, I've got to go see General Grant today, and I'd rather die a thousand deaths. That must have been something to that Christian gentleman to talk to that lush and take out his sword and hand that sword over there and say, we surrender. That's a terrible thing to say. But not nothing like Matthew 25. You don't know. I'd like to see it. Not anybody want to challenge me, but feel open. I want to show, have you show me anywhere in the history of the universe where anybody under any condition said anything worse than what Jesus Christ said. Depart you curse of everlasting fire prepared for the devil of angels. You know, back in January 27, 1903, uh, uh, and the same asylum burned down in London, and 50 of the 200 inmates burned to death. And it wasn't a chorus type of thing, you know, where the bureaucrats of Washington, you know, decided to put on a show for the news media and get 83 people killed by just being stupid and putting on a show. It wasn't like that. And they actually burned, and 50 of out of 200 were burned to death because they wouldn't come out. And they wouldn't come out where people trying to help them. I mean, the people in London weren't shooting inflammable tear gas. They are trying to get them burned and then put on a show. It wasn't like that. They were trying to get them out. And they're knocking the doors, and the coops inside had the doors locked. They wouldn't open the doors because they said, you're trying to scare us. You're taking us out to kill us because there isn't any fire. Others of them hid under the beds. And uh, some of them just said, they said, you set fire to the place, you know, to, to scare us. And they tried to get them out. They, they got 150 of them out, but 50 of them burned to death in there. And I stand up and I warn people about going to hell and going to hell. You think it's something I made up. <laughs> you think I'm trying to scare you. It's just the preacher. He just delights in this. The slaughterhouse religion, this uh, gospel of, you know, God being a torture master. And so you hide under the bed, you know. And I bang at your door, and you lock the door, and you won't open. Christ said, I stand at the door and knock. Then if I hear my voice and open the door, I'll come and sup with him and he with me. And what's going to happen? You're going to burn. You're going to burn. You are going to burn. Now, when I was a young man, I was dumb enough to take a lot of dares like I talked to you about. And that, Courage stuff, you know, and take on the challenge. But I'll tell you, boy, when the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and showed me what I had coming ahead out here, you talk about chicken it out, boy, I crawl fish all the way. Amen. And that's the widest move I ever made. A fellow said to me one time, he said, Ruckman, he said, the only reason you're saved, got saved because you're just scared about going to hell. I said, I said, you got my number, brother. You got my number. That's just exactly why I did get saved. I got saved because I don't want to go to a place and burn and burn and burn and burn forever. Be careful if you're not careful with anything else. I'm careless about a lot of things, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. But don't you be careless about that one. Years ago in this country, we had a fellow called the Louisiana Kingfish. His name is Huey Long. On a September the 10th, 1935, he got assassinated by a German doctor named Carl Weiss down there in Baton Rouge. When he got assassinated, the fellow was hiding behind a post there at the state capitol of Baton Rouge and came out behind that post and put three or four shots at him and killed him. But what you didn't know about that story, which they don't talk much about and say much about, is the fact that before that thing took place, uh, Huey was staying there in Baton Rouge in a, in a hotel that night and got up that morning to drive the state capitol. And when he came to the... Uh, the lobby of the hotel in Baton Rouge, he had a bunch of newspaper reporters around him, all hounding him, you know, and hollering, you know, and, and what about this, uh, Governor, what about this, what about the bill here, Governor, are you going to be here, and you're so, so bad here, all that kind of stuff. And back here in the back of that crowd was a farmer who was raised up in North Louisiana, where you were long have been raised. Uh, Louisiana's about half Catholic and half Baptist. But Jimmy Davis, you know, that bunch. And this old farm had been raised up with uh, Huey Long up in the country, was trying to get his attention over some kind of a farm bill or something, and he said, could I... Can I talk to you just a minute, uh, Huey? Can I see you just a minute, Huey? And he was pushing his way through the reporters there and trying to get to a, a, a chauffeur there at the door to take him on down to the state capitol. And his old farm buddy from up the country was saying, just, just let me, just five minutes, Huey, just five minutes. And go through that crowd, Huey along, turn around and said, I couldn't give you five minutes if you're Jesus Christ. Walked out the door. 
And nobody knows what he said to that chauffeur. That chauffeur didn't say that he talked on the way to the Capitol. He just got there and got in, got out, walked up the Capitol steps, and stepped on a pillar, and blam, 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 that was that, you know. And as far as anybody knows, the last words he said were, I couldn't give you five minutes if you were Jesus Christ. Well, I bet he can give him five minutes now. You can't give Christ five minutes of your time? You won't bet? I bet the time is coming you'll give him more than that. I bet the time is coming you'll give him five years, and five million years, and five trillion years, and five billion years, and you'll be down there, you know what you'll be saying? You'll be saying, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful, be careful now. Be careful now. Let's stand for prayer. Let's stand for prayer. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we beseech the Holy Spirit tonight to work in this congregation. If any unsaved sinner here tonight, we pray that they'll avail themselves tonight of the atonement of Jesus Christ, die for their sin, not take a chance. If somebody here tonight is taking a chance and confused about it, may they uh, put their soul tonight at rest on, on the finished work of Jesus Christ and trust nothing but Him and nobody but Him and, and forsake all these foolish little self-righteous things, these hopes of trying to do better and be better, and all these things whereby men lie awake to deceive with cunning craftiness. And Lord, we pray for the salvation of men, women, and children in this building tonight. May nobody go out of here Father, headed for the wrong place, by the grace of God. Now let's remain standing, please, the head bowed and eyes closed just a few minutes before we begin to sing tonight. In a few minutes we're going to sing an invitation hymn. Before we sing, I want you to say, people, to spend a little time in prayer. I don't feel like you've been praying enough. I know I've been praying enough, and I don't think you have either. You can't depend upon me to do this work. The spiritual work, the Holy Spirit has to do it. You need to pray, and pray for the Holy Spirit to deal with people in this building right now. There are probably unsaved people here tonight. The Holy Spirit has to show these things to them. I can make, I can draw them a picture and make it plain of the nose in their face, but the Holy Spirit has to show them the truth of it. I want to have you pray a while. Ask God to save somebody here tonight. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm not talking about baptism. While we wait in prayer and some young men here at the altar already, let me give an invitation, extend an invitation tonight to any man in this building. If you're half a man, you've got half a man left, buddy. If you're not saved and you, know to be, you need to be saved, will you get out of your seat right now and show your colors? You come down here and join us sinners down here and accept Christ. If you will, come on. Come on. Your knees are kind of shaking. Your palms are kind of wet. I shook six palms this morning like they've been dumped in a bucket of water. Now, we need preaching on the saved people. If you're on the saved here tonight, need Christ, come forward now. Come forward now. What? You want to be saved? Just me here. Just me here. Now, I'm going to play. You play with me, okay? Just then walk up the platform so I want to be saved. Hey, good, good, good. Would God be had about four or five men here in their 30s, 40s, and 50s that kind of courage? 
Because that kid hasn't got courage. He's just dumb. He's smarter than you are, buddy. Yeah. He's smarter than you are. That Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You don't get any smart. You learn to fear God. Somebody else. Christian, keep praying. Keep praying. Our people are getting saved. Keep praying. That's about the same the Lord here tonight. Somebody else. Let's see a man here tonight. Come on, boy. You're going to come in, aren't you? You're going to come in, aren't you? You're going to try me out, boy? You're coming in, boy? Come on. Is there a man anywhere in this building tonight? Well, except Jesus Christ, if I go back there on my hands and knees, to your feet, if there is, raise your hand. I'll start for you right now. Put your hand up. If you doubt my integrity and doubt my honesty and doubt my humility, think I'm a fake, a television evangelist, check me out, buddy. Check me out. Call my hand, okay? 52 on the table. Face up, okay? Call me out. See if I'll do it. Oh, Robert said to give you a proposition like that. Robert Schuler, give me swagger to ever give it to you that way. You think I'm a faker? You think I'm a huckster and a hoax? Try me for size, man. Raise your hand. You accept Christ? If I come back to you, get down there and lick your boots, raise your hand. God help you, man. God help you. What number is that, Miss? 262. Let's look this way, if you would get your hymn on. Let's sing about three stanzas of hymn 262. Hymn 262. Careful, careful, be careful, be careful. Listen, if Ruckman says you've got to be careful, you've got to be careful. <laughs> 